So uh, we're going to do something a little bit different this morning with the scripture reading. Uh, every week, or almost every week, I get to share these remarkable words from the Bible, and, and it certainly is my honor and my privilege to do so. But this morning's story is so familiar that I think all of us could probably tell the story from memory if we had to. So I'm going to ask for, I think there's five volunteers to read a couple of the verses of our scripture reading this morning, and then we'll move on to the next person. So I'm going to get the microphone. And see if there's any volunteers that want to read. It's just a couple of quick verses. All right. You want to stand up, Linda? Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? In a second. Go in. He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, the Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on to the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. One more. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Thank you to all of our volunteer readers. I was inspired to uh, handle the scripture reading this way by an idea expressed by Barbara Brown Taylor, the great Episcopal priest and seminary professor and author, who writes this. She says, if it's still possible for us to be moved by stories that we've heard more times than we can count, and to preach those same stories to people who know every word of them by heart, then it's because we're followers of the Word made flesh, the living Word, who never sounds exactly the same way twice. So I want to play with that idea of the Word made flesh this morning. Now granted, that's the title that's applied to Jesus in the first verses of John's Gospel. But I think it can also apply to the Bible. This is the Word. And when we read it, and when we hear it, and most importantly, when we live it, it also 
becomes the Word made flesh. The Bible is the living Word of God, after all, and we breathe new life into it every time we read it, every time we engage with the text. So when I read it out loud on Sunday mornings from the pulpit, all of the characters in the story wind up sounding a little bit like me. When Linda reads it, or when Bruce reads it, or when Leanne reads it, everything takes on a slightly different feel. The the only way that this book, the Bible, holds meaning for us is if we keep it alive. So one of the other benefits of thinking about the Bible as the Word made flesh is that when we come to a story like this one, the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, a familiar story that many of us have heard so many times that we can tell the story without having to even really think about it, the benefit is that the Word made flesh allows that story to never sound the same way to us twice. And if there's a gospel story that everyone knows, even people that are not of the Christian faith, it's likely to be the story of the Good Samaritan. After all, we've embraced that story as a society to the point that we've named hospitals, nursing homes, and even banks and credit unions after the main character. We have laws named after him and we and modeled after his good deeds. There are lots of ways in which we, as a secular community, celebrate and remember this story. And that's okay, because that's the idea, right? We tell and we retell these biblical passages over and over and over, year after year after year, because we want to get the idea across. We want people to internalize these teachings, to make these teachings such a part of themselves that when confronted with a similar situation, they will act, we will act, in the same way that the Samaritan in the story does. But the challenge to that sense of familiarity is that we tend to miss all of the shock value that this story would have had the first time that Jesus shared it. You see, the crux of this story is that there were not any Samaritans who would have been considered good by those in Jesus' audience. In fact, there wasn't a bigger, there wasn't a more hated enemy to the Jews than the Samaritans. Samaria was a nation founded by several of the tribes of Israel that split away from the southern kingdom in the 8th century B.C. They read a different version of the Torah. They had a different temple that was the center of their worship life. And both Samaritans and Jews claimed to be God's chosen people. And the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. In fact, contact with someone from the other group would render you unclean to participate in civic or religious life. Now, it might be hard for us to wrap our minds around what that meant. But Professor Amy Jill Levine contemporizes the parable in this way. She places the story in Samaria, which today has more familiar names like the West Bank and Occupied Palestine. The man in the ditch, in her version, is an Israeli Jew. And the two passerbys are a Jewish rabbi and a member of the Israeli Knesset. And the person who takes pity on the Jewish man is a Palestinian Muslim, a member of Hamas. Levine suggests that we could call that story the parable of the good Muslim. And just like that, the Word is made flesh for a new generation of listeners. And while it might be the first time that most Israeli Jews would put the words good and Muslim together, it's the idea that sometimes 
we have to start telling a different kind of story before a different kind of future can unfold. In this case, Jesus calls us to the idea that the good news is only good when we have given up our own ideas about who is good and bad. And that's the catch, isn't it? This story is not really about a guy who did a good deed when others wouldn't. This story is about what can happen when we allow the Word to be made flesh in us and through us. It changes who we are. It changes how we act towards each other. But we have to allow the Word to become alive first. So watch again how Jesus interacts with the lawyer in our reading from this morning. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the lawyer's question. And it's, it's a do question, not a be question. It's not even a believe question. Now, like Jesus, this lawyer has been raised on Torah, which is all about how to live, not necessarily what to believe. His question concerns practice and not belief. He wants Jesus to tell him in plain language what kind of life he should be living right now in order to live in God's presence forever. And it's a good question, even if it is a test. As Taylor asks, you'd want to know the answer, wouldn't you? I think we all would. And Jesus' answer comes from the Shema, the most important part of daily Jewish prayer life. Both Jesus and the lawyer know what the Shema says. But notice that Jesus makes the lawyer say it out loud. He makes the lawyer speak the living word. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your might and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus' response to this, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. It's a call to action. It's a call to bring the Word to life through action. But it's not enough for the lawyer. And so who is my neighbor, he asks. Which gets us back to the real sticking point for so many of us. The point Jesus is making is that everyone is the Word made flesh. We're children of God, created by God, and each one of us has that spark of the divine inside of us. Now some people have fed and nurtured that spark, and the divine presence in them blazes like a fire. But others due to disappointment or frustration or anger or confusion, have tried to hide their spark. But it's still there. And then most of us, largely for innocuous reasons, have hardened our hearts so that we can no longer see that spark in certain people. And that's the story that Jesus is telling. The priest and the Levite who passed by the man in the ditch, they were probably good people, but they had just lost the ability to see the divine in others, especially those who they had been led to believe were not capable of carrying such a spark. And that's where the great sins of racism and nationalism and classism come from. Several years ago, I think I talked about this trip a couple weeks ago, we took a group of young people from St. Peter's on a mission trip to Atlanta, where our work for the week focused on the large homeless population in the city. At one of the agencies that some of our groups served at that week, the agency director gave us some specific directions for the time that we would be serving and beyond. 
when you leave this place, he said, don't talk about us and them. Don't tell people what you did for them. His point was that we're all the same. We all come from the same place. Some of us just face different struggles and challenges than others. The agency director didn't say it explicitly, but I think what he was really telling our group was that everyone has that divine spark within them. Everyone is the Word made flesh in their own way. And that we should treat everyone with the same attention and the same compassion as we would treat the one we call the Word made flesh. That's our job as Christians. That's our job as children of God. It's our job as decent human beings to see and acknowledge the divine spark in everyone that we meet. As we fed some of our friends who were experiencing homelessness that evening, I made a point to look into the eyes of as many of them as I could. And the spark was there. It was pretty dim in some eyes for sure, but it was definitely there. There was no difference between me and those for whom that ham sandwich might be the only thing they had to eat that day. The big difference between the Good Samaritan and the priest and the Levite, the Samaritan went to him. He came near, close enough that he could see that divine spark. And he knew what he had to do. That's what Jesus calls all of us to do. To come near. Near enough to see. Near enough to feel. Near enough to recognize a neighbor in someone who needs a neighbor very badly. Near enough to get your hands dirty. Near enough to recognize another child of God. Do this, the Word made flesh says, and you will live. Thanks be to God. Amen.